Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on NPTEL MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. Recall that in the previous lecture, we started talking about using the financial toolbox of MATLAB in order to look at portfolio optimization problem. And in this lecture, we will continue our discussion on that and we will look at uh, today's topic on two fund theorem being used in order to derive the optimized portfolios. Uh, so, for this we will look at the derivation of an efficient frontier and the tangent portfolio and with the point of tangency will later be identified as the point where the sharp ratio is maximum and we will look at these problems not just in terms of the basic mean variance optimization setup, but also by incorporating some practical realistic constraints that we see in actual market. So, we start off with uh, portfolio optimization examples. Uh, so, we will look at a few examples uh, which mainly uses this uh, portfolio object that is a critical part of the financial toolbox. And uh, the specific example that we will look at is uh, how to set up a mean variance portfolio optimization problem uh, with an emphasis on a few things namely the two fund theorem uh, and also we will incorporate the notion of transaction cost and turnover constraint into the problem. And we will look at the problem of maximization of the sharp ratio, which was an indicator of uh, effectiveness in the management of the portfolio. And we will briefly mention uh, two popular hedge fund strategies, namely the dollar neutral and 130 30 portfolios. So, we will just mention those since they, they were not a part of our regular discussion in the preceding lectures. So, uh, first thing we do is we will have to set up the data. And uh, we'll see that uh, how this example works for the monthly total returns. So we are just looking at the monthly returns, and by total returns that we mean that we are talking about the returns uh, without bringing into picture uh, things like transaction cost and turnover constraints. And we will uh, focus on uh, composition of 30 blue chip stocks. So blue chip stocks are the ones uh, of companies which have a reputation for quality, reliability and most importantly the profitability both in good and in stressed market conditions. And this uh, term blue chip comes from uh, the game of poker where uh, you have chips with the blue chips having a high value. So uh, for this purpose uh, the MATLAB toolbox here uses data uh, which are real data but this data have been chosen for illustrative purposes. Uh, and uh, is not intended to actually talk about uh, or giving investment uh, advice. So, instead of this data which is included in MATLAB which is called the blue chip stock moments dot mat, uh, we essentially which comprises of this blue chip stocks, so you can use your own uh, files uh, for uh, the asset uh, parameters. Uh, so, accordingly we first uh, load this uh, the blue chip stock moments. So, this will give the moments of this blue chip stocks. And remember that these are just the monthly total returns. And uh, once uh, so, once you have loaded this, then uh, we will we'll take the uh, we will define m ret that is the market return to be equal to the market mean. And uh, market risk is uh, will be taken to be the square root of the market variance. Uh, so, accordingly, uh, similarly, we will take what is known as the cash mean. Uh, and identify is at C red and we will talk about uh, the square root of cash var which will be taken as C R S K. So, let me just elaborate what this cash mean uh, this concept of cash uh, mean and cash var and market mean and market var. So, here the cash uh, term uh, indicates the cash component uh, and is used as a proxy for cash. So, you can view this as some sort of uh, a risk free investment. 
and uh, the market mean or the market variance you can view this is that these are uh, akin to uh, equities or a portfolio of equities and uh, particularly the market portfolio. Uh, now, uh, accordingly for that purpose, we uh, essentially look at the average uh, return from the market mean and we will look at the average uh, uh, mean of the cash and for the counterpart risk, we look at the square root of the variances for the market as well as the cash. So, the next thing that we do is we create a portfolio object and uh, the purpose of this creation of a portfolio object is to uh, bring into the picture the asset list. So, we will incorporate the asset list and we will bring in the risk free rate which is taken to be the cash mean and, uh, and the moments of the asset return. So, we will basically uh, incorporate the individual asset means as well as the asset covariance. So, uh, this is just like a starting point where you set up the basic essential uh, components that are required for the portfolio object. So, uh, then what you do is uh, for the purpose of comparison, what you do is that we set up an equal weight portfolio and by equal weight portfolio, I essentially mean that the weights assigned uh, to the portfolio are taken to be all identical to each other and uh, we make it the initial portfolio. Uh, so, accordingly you see that we set the initial portfolio to be uh, 1 over p the number of assets and so that means the E risk and E return. So, that means the E here stands for the equivalent portfolio. This, uh, the, this will be essentially these values will be returned by the estimation of the portfolio moments of the initial portfolio that was set up with the equal number of weights or the equal level of weights being assigned to all the, uh, all the assets that are a part of the portfolio. So, uh, the next thing we do is uh, we will now look at how to plot this. Now, in order to plot this, we uh, what we are going to do is that we are going to uh, look at three components. So, the first two are the market and the cash components and for that we, we recall that the market risk and market return and the cash risk and cash return. And so, for the equivalent portfolio, we take the risk and the return for the equivalent portfolio and for this three components namely the market cash and the equal weights we essentially then have uh, this uh, this plot for all of this in the mu sigma diagram. So, this is nothing but on the y axis we have the mean of returns and on the x axis we have the standard deviation of returns. So, let me just identify particular uh, terms here. So, in this case what you are doing here uh, is that we are doing a scatter plot. So, the first thing that we are doing is a market portfolio. So, this is where the market portfolio lies. Then you have the cash portfolio which lies here. So, as you can see that the risk is effectively 0 because it is a cash position and the portfolio with all equal words lies here. And then in addition to that we also do the scatter plot which will plot the, uh, the individual mean uh, and, and variances for each of the individual assets that are a part of the database with these blue chip stocks. So, for example, here you will see there are several uh, databases. So, for example, if you observe here HPQ that is for uh, Hewlett Packard and uh, then you have GM that is for General Motors. Uh, for example, uh, there is JNJ, so that is Johnson & Johnson. So, each of those corresponds to uh, a whole bunch of these companies. And so, this is just uh, a mu sigma scatter plot of all the companies that have been considered in the database, their expected return and risk as given by the standard deviation along with the risk and return of the cash, the market and the equal weighted portfolio. So, this is the basic plot that we have uh, for uh, this database of blue chip stock. Now, we need to set up the optimization problem one by one and then uh, solve for those. So, what you do is that we will, uh, so we set up a mean variance portfolio optimization problem and it is set up default constraints are set up for that. So, by default constraints it means that uh, of course, you know you will have the sum of the words being equal to 1. Uh, and in addition to that, you are not allowed any short selling. That means, your weights must all be greater than or equal to 0. So, with this initial problem, the goal is to uh, figure out what is going to be the efficient frontier. So, accordingly, we will set the default constraints as I mentioned that all long positions with the sum of weights being equal to 1. And then, what you do is that we estimate the efficient frontier 
and then we get the uh, estimate the portfolio moments of the efficient frontier uh, and store them as the p risk and p r s k and p return. So, in this case what does the efficient frontier look like? The efficient frontier uh, looks like you know it is pretty much the same diagram that you have here with the that you got earlier the scatter plot, but uh, on top of that. So, in this case you observe that it is the scatter plot of the market cash and the equilibrated portfolio uh, as well as the individual assets, but on top of this we have this blue curve which is going to be the uh, efficient frontier of uh, this uh, database of individual uh, assets of all the blue chip st uh, stock companies. So, uh, now we will talk about the tangent line to the efficient frontier. Remember that we will eventually make use of the goal. The first problem that we will look at is going to be the two fund theorem. So, the two fund theorem will basically make use of uh, a combination of investment in cash as well as uh, a risky portfolio. So, uh, now what do you do here is the following that uh, the portfolio uh, that has been already been set up, the object that was set up earlier, it already has the risk free rate. So, what do you do is the following. So, we can generate the tangent line and what is the tangent line? So, the tangent line is nothing but uh, it is basically a, a collation or a collection of uh, all those uh, points on the mu sigma diagram as you uh, vary your risk free rate from 0 percent to 100 percent or that is from 0 to 1. So, accordingly we set the budget of this risk free asset from 0 to 1 and then what you do is that we essentially what we will now have is we will have the scatter plot as before we will have the efficient frontier and then now we will essentially generate this line. So, here you observe that we will make use of the alphabet p risk and um, p return for in or for the portfolio itself and then when we talk about in order to generate the efficient frontier and the q here will indicate the uh, the tangent line uh, which is tangent to the efficient frontier so now uh, what you do is that uh, in this case so now what you have to do is now that we have set up this mu sigma diagram for e each of the individual assets along with these three assets and we now have the efficient frontier as well as the tangent portfolio. So, uh, we now need to what you do is that we want to obtain efficient uh, portfolios uh, with a pre specified value of either risk or return. So, what you do is basically that means that you want to figure out an efficient portfolio uh, for your either where you either uh, pre specify what is the level of risk that you are willing to take or you pre specify what is the return that you are expecting and it is necessary to obtain the range of returns and risk amongst all the portfolios. So, accordingly what you do is in order to accomplish this we talk about what is known as the estimate frontier limits function. So, what is this estimate frontier limits? So, estimate frontier limits basically what it does is that before you can actually set your uh, target for your return or you want to set um, a maximum tolerance for risk level, you first really need to know that what are the values of return and risk at this end point and at this particular end point. So, that you do not end up choosing a return that is not even anywhere on the efficient frontier. Uh, so, accordingly you get this. So, if you observe carefully. So, here we say that the monthly portfolio returns are between 0 0.9 percent and 1.8 percent. So, this graph is remember that this is based this efficient frontier is based on the monthly returns of the individual assets. So, accordingly you observe that for the returns that means from the return at the bottom most end of the efficient frontier to the top most end it ranges from 0 0.9 to 1.8 percent. Similarly, if you observe carefully and from 3.5 to 9 percent, so this act, so in annualized terms this means that it will range from 11.2 percent to 21.5 percent. So, let me just be more specific that uh, if you look carefully here uh, that this, this value that you have here this is somewhere around 0 0.11. And, and, the, and the top value is somewhere 0 0.21. So, that means the range is from 11.2 percent to 21.5 percent and this is what translates to 0 0.9 percent and 1.8 percent on a monthly basis. And likewise you have uh, 
12.1% to 31.3%. So, if we observe carefully, the variance that we have here is probably 0 0.12 and this is around 0 0.31. So, that means the, the annual rate, rate, uh, risk uh, percentage is from 12.1% to 31.3% and this manifests at uh, to an equivalent monthly value and in order to move to the monthly value you just cannot divide by 12 but you have to factor in a square root of capital T which is the square root of 12. Okay, so now that uh, we have this uh, entire setup of the assets along with the efficient frontier and the tangent portfolio, we now can talk about uh, we once this uh, has given us an idea as to what range of returns uh, that you are looking at and what is the risk uh, range that is available to us. So, now we are in a position to answer our uh, prior question of determining a portfolio with a targeted return and a targeted risk. So, by targeted we mean here that there is a specific target that we have in mind as far as our return is concerned and there is a level of risk that we are not willing to exceed as far as our investment strategy is concerned. So, accordingly we say that so what do you do is that for example in a for illustrative purposes we will input a target return of 0 0.2 or 20, uh, 20 percent and uh, this means that we want a expected return of 20 percent and we will target the risk at 0 0.15 so that means you are willing to accept up to 15 percent of the risk so accordingly what you do is that we will estimate the efficient frontier by return and we will uh, will essentially take the target return by 12 so, this is what is going to be this is the we will input the annualized target return and risk and then we will convert this to the monthly return and risk and so this gives us the, the estimated. So, in this case ARSK and ART these are going to basically give us the, uh, the target uh, return uh, on a monthly basis. So, that means that it is going to give us a, a portfolio or the efficient portfolio with the targeted return of 20 percent per annum and in the second case you see that we are taking the target risk and dividing by square root of 12. So, remember that I said that we have to decide, divide this uh, by square root of capital T. So, in this case uh, we, we get the efficient frontier for the second case when our target risk has been set at 15 percent. So, once you do this, what you do is that we now keep extending our uh, plot that was done earlier. So, remember that so as before we have all the uh, return and risk of the individual components along with whatever we had uh, seen earlier in terms of the market equally and cash return and we have the efficient frontier that we have we see here. So, uh, then uh, what we have here we observe that in addition to whatever we had seen earlier, we now have identified the two specific portfolios. Now, this is a portfolio which has the expected the portfolio on the efficient frontier with mu p or the expected return to be 20 percent and this uh, the other point here, this is going to be the 15 percent level of risk for the portfolio. Uh, and it is that portfolio which runs uh, lies on the efficient frontier with a 15 percent risk. So, now uh, we need to actually look at uh, uh, determining the exact portfolio uh, for the 20 percent return and the 15 percent risk and uh, so accordingly we will use a uh, uh, blotter with, so that uh, you know or a table that will consist of the portfolio weights. So, first of all we will use a blotter uh, which essentially takes uh, 100 uh, percent into A W G T. Remember A W G T, this is going to be the one corresponding to the targeted return and so it turns out that the portfolio with a 20 percent target return will comprise of these six individual assets. Observe here that amongst this the highest uh, weight uh, adding up to about 80 percent of the portfolio are for U T X which is 56 percent and W M T is 31.253. So, this UTX is Raytheon Technologies and WMT is Walmart. Okay, uh, now, this was what was identified as a A blotter corresponding to A weight for the uh, X targeted return of 20 percent and the next thing we do is that we will consider the BWDGT which is for the targeted risk of 15 percent and we will store the, uh, the portfolio in terms of percentage as this blotter which you call as B blotter. So, this of this as you can see has a much larger number of assets that are in, in it, 
uh, in particular I want to identify the ones which actually have more than 10 percent. So, the first one you can identify is uh, M, uh, triple M which is 16 percent. So, this is uh, the, the company 3 M. Uh, the next is uh, you have M O uh, and uh, this M O which is 15 percent this is Microsoft and then we have UTX which is uh, 10 percent. So, as already mentioned this is going to be Raytheon technologies and uh, uh, you have 25 percent for WMT that is Walmart and 12.69 percent uh, that is XOM which is Exxon Mobil. So, uh, you have been able to actually now identify uh, the, the portfolios that you want uh, as per your requirement. Now, you are now free to actually set whatever uh, target return you want and whatever target risk you want of course, within the range that was obtained in the uh, in the previous step. So, once you pick up any return or risk within the range that has been obtained, you can essentially immediately uh, th through this command you can you can estimate the weights of the specific portfolio as per your personal preferences. So, this is you can see is a very useful tool because it straight away gives you the weights of the portfolio to satisfies your constraints. Now, so far what we have been doing here is that we have been essentially looking at only uh, the cases that uh, of, a, of a mean variance portfolio optimization uh, by looking at this, uh, these assets uh, without even actually accounting for uh, the practical reality of uh, transaction costs and turnover. So, now we uh, look at an extension of the problem to make it more realistic and accordingly we incorporate the transaction cost. So, uh, again you know the portfolio uh, object that is there in the MATLAB financial toolbox, it is uh, amenable and has uh, the provision for accounting for the transaction cost as a part of the uh, individualized problem. So, accordingly uh, uh, what you can do is that we can set up individual costs for each asset. So, I mean that this is the transaction cost for example, you might have to give a brokerage and uh, you can. Uh, so, as an illustrative purpose we set up a uniform transaction cost across all assets and uh, once you do that we can calculate the efficient frontiers of gross versus net. So, the gross, uh, gross efficient frontier is nothing but the efficient frontier without this cost being included and the net portfolio is the portfolio where these uh, costs are actually being included. So, here for the elasticity purpose we say the buying and selling costs are both 0.0020 or 0.2 percent, but of course, you know you are free to choose other values depending on what exactly is the cost involved and instead of having uniform cost there is of course, the room for uh, setting up individual cost for each individual asset separately. So, this you know the set cost is now assigned to this variable q and now we are going to make an estimation of the efficient frontier after having incorporated the, the costs in terms of this q and then we get the estimation of the portfolio moments using this q and the q weight that means q weight is the, uh, the weights of the efficient frontier after having incorporated the cost in as a as q. So, again we now look at the plot. So, here we have the efficient frontier without the transaction cost. So, observe carefully here. Here everything is pretty much the same as before. You have all these individual assets, market and cash and this equal portfolio. And as I said that you know here you uh, earlier we had looked at what is the uh, gross uh, efficient frontier which is this case which is the dotted line and this bold line that you have here this is the uh, net efficient frontier. So, this is one constraint that had to be included. The second constraint that we consider for inclusion is what is known as the turnover constraint. So, you would recall that from the previous lecture we talked about that, um, that the portfolio object in addition to transaction cost it also can accommodate turnover constraints and remember that uh, the turnover constraint was basically uh, some sort of a restriction on the extent to which you can do your trading uh, because you have to reshuffle your portfolio from time to time in order to obtain the best optimized portfolio. But in order to ensure that you, there, there is no 
uh, not too much of volume of transaction because that also incurs cost. So, accordingly we will demonstrate in this example the next example that you are considering here that a turnover constraint it produces the efficient frontier in the neighborhood of the initial portfolio. So, accordingly what we do is that we now uh, you know in addition to the uh, to the cost of 0 0.0020 of buying and selling that uh, that is 0. Uh, to 2 percent that is applicable in case of uh, the cost, we set the turnover at 0 0.2 or 20 percent. So, uh, accordingly we set Q. So, now this Q that we have here, this uh, uh, of course, as before uh, the buying and the selling cost are included. So, this is what you have done when you consider only the transaction cost and on top of it now we add to Q the uh, turnover as per our specification which in this case is uh, 0 0.2 or 20 percent. So, accordingly what we do is that we will now have the efficient frontier uh, that is being estimated and the output being, uh, uh, being set uh, to give you uh, the weights and the, and the quantity of buying and selling. So, once you have this of course, again you will have a similar kind of efficient frontier. So, here you have to observe carefully that uh, here we had this unconstrained uh, uh, efficient frontier uh, and here in, in this uh, bold line we have the efficient frontier which has accommodated for a maximum of 20 percent turnover. Okay, uh, so, now uh, let us now talk you about a tracking error constraint. So, let us now talk about again we go back to the portfolio object that is inbuilt into MATLAB and we can handle tracking error constraints where tracking error is the relative risk of a portfolio compared to the tracking portfolio. So, here we do is that we have a portfolio that is being actively managed and in order to uh, track the errors we introduce a tracking portfolio and uh, the goal is to ensure that you have to find those efficient portfolios with tracking constraints. Uh, with tracking errors that are within 5 percent of the tracking portfolio. So, essentially it is some sort of uh, you know controlling portfolio and the efficient portfolios uh, is th that you want is the one that is not too far from this tracking portfolio. And in this case the specific example that is being considered here is that uh, these errors are within the 5 percent limit uh, of the tracking portfolio. So, now how do we set up the tracking portfolio? So, uh, here is a, a, so a tracking portfolio in this example and there are different ways in which you can do this. So, in this case the tracking portfolio is being collected as a, a sub collection of 9 asset uh, from an equally weighted uh, portfolio. So, accordingly uh, we will identify the index of the, of the assets that you want to uh, include in the tracking portfolio. So, out of uh, you know say 30 assets you have identified that you, you will include the those particular assets which are indexed 15, 16, 20, 21 all the way to 30. These are the ones that you are going to include in a in the tracking portfolio. So, that means that uh, while the main portfolio has a larger number of assets for inclusion, the tracking portfolio will have a subset uh, of those collections of those assets and the tracking error is then set to 0.05 or 5 percent uh, divided by square root of 12 for the monthly tracking and the tracking portfolio here is set to be 0 31. So, that means what you do here is the following that the tracking portfolio here initially is set to be have weights all 0 and what you do is that then you assign the weight of 1 uh, to those uh, points in the uh, th those components of the tracking portfolio which are there for inclusion. So, this will mean that for the 30 entries in the, uh, in the portfolio uh, in the tracking portfolio only 9 have non-zero values which are all set to be equal to 1 and obviously then the sum of those weights is going to be equal to 9. So, uh, then you divide then by the sum of this tracking portfolio which is 9. So, that means that the all the 9 entries of 1 that are there uh, will now be uh, converted to 1 by 9. So, again we estimate the efficient frontier and this is the efficient frontier of Q which incorporates uh, the tracking error and, uh, and takes care of the tracking portfolio. 
So, uh, here we will estimate the portfolio moments and uh, uh, for the weights and then with the, the one with the tracking portfolio. So, what you do now is that we will calculate the efficient, port uh, efficient frontier in both the scenarios. So, in the first one what we will do is that uh, the one with the dotted line this is going to be nothing but the unconstrained uh, efficient frontier as before uh, with no constraints being imposed and uh, this uh, this red one is the tracking portfolio. So, this is the expected this point here represents the expected return and risk of the tracking portfolio which comprises of those 9 assets that have been identified with an equal amount of weight being assigned to each of them. And then you know on the basis of that what you can do is that without tracking this dotted line would be the, uh, the, the efficient frontier, but with tracking which only allows uh, an error of 5 percent the efficient frontier obviously gets reduced significantly because it cannot be too far from the tracking portfolio. So, it gets significantly curtailed as is evident from the length of the efficient frontier and the, it is that part uh, you know it is essentially that part of the efficient frontier is closest to it which as essentially satisfies the condition that the tracking error should not be more than uh, 5 percent. Okay, now, we will look at an example of the combined turnover and the tracking error constraints. So, suppose that we set the turnover to um, a maximum of 30 percent and we say that the tracking error can be 5 percent. So, now we are looking at the constraint uh, problem which brings into picture the constraint of the tracking error uh, that was there in the preceding example and along with it the combined turnover. So, accordingly here we set the turnover to be 0 0.3 and we set the initial portfolio, the, the portfolio to be this and then we have this tracking portfolio as given here. Uh, so, the initial portfolio is set to be the uh, portfolio uh, to be an equal weighted portfolio. So, there are three aspects here that needs to be taken care of. The first is that the turnover is set at 30 percent. Now, in order to start your generation of the efficient frontier portfolio, you need to have some initial portfolio. So, the initial portfolio is set uh, to be uh, an equal weighted portfolio and the tracking error portfolio is the same as that is that has been set before. So, there are two portfolios here, one is the initial portfolio and one is the tracking error portfolio. So, uh, accordingly uh, what you do is that we, uh, so here Q is, is set to be, uh, you set the turnover and you have this initial portfolio that you have here and you estimate the portfolio moments for Q and you calculate what is going to be the, you de determine what is going to be the efficient frontier. So, for if you observe carefully here, this is a cash in the market. So, the reason why are we are only identifying cash and market because these are the two important uh, portfolios. And then uh, we have this unconstrained efficient frontier that we have in the top and this is the initial portfolio and this is the tracking portfolio. So, starting off with this initial portfolio, you are able to reach the tracking portfolio uh, that is tracking efficient frontier which, uh, which is determined by a constraint of being the tracking error being no more than 5 percent. So, you start from here. And with this initial constraint and with this tracking portfolio, the those portfolios which satisfy the condition of 5 percent tracking error that will constitute this uh, significantly truncated efficient frontier that is given here in bold. Okay, uh, so, now uh, the next thing that we want to look at is what is known as the maximization of the sharp ratio. So, remember that the sharp ratio is a critical uh, measure of portfolio performance analysis and it is given by the return to risk. So, it is the excess return to risk and, uh, and particularly uh, we are interested in a portfolio that maximizes the sharp ratio and it turns out that this is the tangency portfolio that we had discussed uh, in the class. So, uh, in this case uh, uh, we know that the, the reason why you want to maximize the sharp ratio is because the sharp ratio does is that it looks at the excess return over risk and the larger uh, this value is the larger it uh, indicates that you are able to achieve uh, a larger amount of excess return uh, per unit uh, 
value of the risk that is given by the standard deviation. So, uh, the maximum sharp ratio portfolio is uh, lies on the efficient frontier. So, accordingly what you do is that we uh, set the, so in this case uh, uh, we plot the efficient frontier with the goal of uh, maximizing the sharp ratio. So, in this case uh, we use the estimate max sharp ratio command to get the corresponding weights which results in the in the maxima sharp ratio and then we uh, generate, uh, we determine what is the corresponding risk and return by again by making use of the command of estimate portfolio moments. So, if you look carefully here uh, in this particular case again we look at the uh, mean of returns and you look at the standard deviation. So, uh, and you see that here uh, it's, uh, we have the scatter plot along with everything else that was there earlier. Uh, of course, you know here I have not put in any constraint. So, this is my efficient frontier and the only thing over and above the basic efficient frontier setup that we had done at the beginning of the class uh, is the identification of this particular point on the efficient frontier which maximizes the sharp ratio and this is the tangent portfolio. So, interestingly uh, it turns out again if you do a blotter of this. So, the blotter of this uh, is going to be uh, again we look at the, uh, the blotter here is going to be the weights of all the portfolios that maximizes the sharp ratio. So, so, this will give you our weights in terms of percentage of the individual assets that constitute the, the portfolio with the maximum sharp ratio. And here if you observe carefully uh, while may most of the weights are extremely low, uh, the, the some of the important weights that you again have you observe it is going to be those similar kind of names that are showing up here. So, 15 percent here for 3M, 13 percent here for uh, Microsoft, 22 percent here for Walmart and 18 percent here for Exxon Mobil. Uh, so, here you can actually do a cross check and verification that the maximum sharp ratio is indeed uh, maximum uh, by this. So, um, uh, we now come to the illustration that the sharp ratio is the tangent portfolio. So, if, uh, in order to obtain that we again just look at uh, the previous problem and remember that in order to prove that this that the sharp ratio is indeed the tangent portfolio what we have to do is that we have to then generate the tangent line and only when we generate the tangent line that the point where it touches the efficient frontier is going to be the tangent portfolio. And if it turns out that the point uh, from a visual point of view, if it turns out that the point where the tangent line touches the efficient frontier is the same as uh, the portfolio with the maximum sharp ratio then you know the illustration of this problem actually has uh, is accomplished. So, accordingly we just look at this particular previous figure that we had here and to it we will now add the tangent uh, tangent line. So, in order to do that again you know we set the budget uh, where the risk free investment can be from 0 all the way to 100 percent. So, we have estimated the efficient frontier for this. So, remember that again we have the scatter plots of the individual assets. Uh, MRSK, CRSK, ERSK correspond to the market cash and equal uh, uh, weights portfolio and uh, uh, this SRK and S return this is going to be generate this particular point which is the point portfolio with the maximum sharp ratio uh, and uh, of course you know here uh, uh, the PRSK and QRSK. So, PRSK it will, it will generate the efficient frontier curve here and QRSK will generate the tangent line. So, you observe very carefully that here this tangent line the it touches the efficient frontier at this point and as you can see visually this is going to be the same as the point which is the maximum sharp ratio. Okay, so, let us now just come to the last uh, topic. Uh, so, I will just explain this in a narrative fashion uh, because this is something that we actually have not done. Uh, in the lecture, but nevertheless it's a, it gives you an interesting insight uh, into more sophisticated approaches of uh, financial investment and these are what are known as a dollar neutral hedge fund structure and the second one is what we call as the 130-30 fund structure. Uh, so, here uh, 
this, uh, this commands that will be done here, uh, it basically makes use of the portfolio optimization tools in hedge fund management. Uh, so, hedge funds essentially are funds uh, with a large amount of assets and typically uh, assets under its management and typically the, as they, they will be handling assets on behalf of high net worth individuals or people who have a lot of disposable cash for investment. Now, two popular strategies uh, that are adopted for portfolio optimization uh, by the hedge fund management, these are what are known as dollar neutral and uh, what are known as 130-30 portfolios, uh, uh, portfolios. Now, let us now first talk about what is the dollar neutral strategy. So, the dollar neutral strategy as the name suggests uh, involves some sort of neutrality. So, more specifically this means that the dollar neutral strategy is the one where one invests equally in long and short position such that the net portfolio position is 0. So, that means that you get into a long position in a certain number of assets and you get into a short position in certain other assets and the total valuation of the long position is equal to the total valuation of the uh, your short position. So, that means that it is something like you are adding and subtracting the same number giving you the net valuation of your portfolio to be equal to 0. Uh, so, you can actually go through this example at on how to uh, set up a, a dollar neutral portfolio. So, if you observe carefully here that here you know the exposure is uh, set to be uh, a, a exposure and minus exposure. So, this is the one that corresponds to the long position and this is the one that uh, is said to be the short position and here also you end up getting an efficient frontier of the dollar neutral. So, if you observe carefully here that this is the efficient frontier that we have here and this is the line, this is the tangent line and this point of tangency is the one with the maximum sharp ratio and I and here. Uh, so, the, so, accordingly this bold curve here, this is what is the dollar neutral efficient frontier and this dotted one is the standard or the usual uh, uh, efficient frontier and if you observe carefully so here uh, you are uh, you have set for fourth the setup for the dollar uh, neutral portfolio and you have uh, estimated the efficient frontiers and so accordingly this to efficient from this to efficient frontier you see that your dollar neutral portfolio that you have that particular efficient frontier is at a higher level than what is given by standard efficient frontier. So, this means that obviously that you have been consistently getting a better return as compared to us the, the standard efficient frontier, uh, but of course, you know you have to recognize that, that to obtain this obviously involves a higher level of risk. Uh, so, accordingly because uh, mainly because you have a, a indulged in a short position and that is the reason why typically these are strategies that are used by hedge funds on behalf of individuals who actually are in a position and, and fiscally and financially well off enough for in order to take such risks. So, accordingly uh, you actually uh, see here that we have a dollar neutral portfolio with the respective weights. Now, as I said that your value, your total position must be equal to 0. So, you observe here that the weights are uh, specified here. So, for example, uh, if you look carefully uh, here J and J there is Johnson and Johnson since this is positive value. So, that means, we have this is the position your long position and 0 is your short position. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, if you look at uh, J P M that is J P Morgan here then it is minus 2.5271. So, that means, his long position is 0 and his short position is 2.5271. Uh, and then you confirm the dollar neutral portfolios and you observe that the long position is, uh, is the same as the short position with the negative sign and consequently the net is going to be equal to 0. Okay, so, let us now come uh, to the, the second example uh, of hedge fund strategies and this is what is known as the 130-30 fund scheme. So, as the name itself again just like dollar neutral the name itself in this case of 130-30 fund structure suggests that it is going to involve some sort of a proportion of 130 and 30 and since 130 is a larger number and 130 minus 30 is equal to 100. So, you can immediately guess that 
it is a structure where uh, you have a net long position, uh, but you you can involve in short positions. So, in this case your long position is 130 and your short position is 30. Uh, so, what you do here is accordingly in this case what you do is that you uh, your sum of the weights is equal to 1 and then you have a leverage of the 0 0.3 weightage and uh, accordingly. So, that means that it is something like you already have a portfolio in the usual way and then you short uh, 30 uh, percent uh, of that amount and you generate uh, the funds. So, essentially you have 130 percent of a long position uh, and then you have a 30 percent of a short position. So, the difference between them which gives you 100 percent of the short position. Uh, so, here this is an example where you can see that, uh, that this is the dotted one is the standard uh, efficient frontier and uh, the one above it in the bold uh, this is going to be an efficient frontier. Uh, in involving this 130-30 portfolio strategy uh, and here is the sharp ratio for that or rather the sharp ratio the, the point or the portfolio with the maximum sharp ratio and uh, even though the name uh, suggests that it is 130-30, uh, but it is not a very rigid structure that you have to involve 130 percent and 30 percent. All that you need is that uh, the sum of these two should end up being equal to 100 percent. So, it could be uh, uh, it could start from a 120 20 structure that means 120 percent long and 20 percent short and go all the way to 150 50 structures of 150 percent long and 50 percent short. Uh, so, if you observe carefully that in this particular efficient frontier, so you can see that uh, the, the one so that means the, the, the particular weights that uh, for the 130 30 portfolio that have been uh, enlisted here that is nothing but uh, the portfolio corresponding to the maximum sharp ratio on the efficient frontier of the 130 uh, 30 portfolio. So, again here you see that you know there are certain weights which are negative for which uh, the position is a short position and, and then there are certain uh, assets like say PG which is Procter and Gamble for which the weight is 17 percent and so that means your long position is 17 percent and the short position is 0 and again you see here you see that if you confirm this uh, uh, this positions. So, you can confirm th this position and it turns out that this position the long position is going to be 130 you just add this up and the short position is 30 and consequently the net position is 100. Uh, so, this takes care of these several examples uh, in case of portfolio optimization problems. So, okay, so let us just do a recap of what we have done in today's class. So, our class today was mainly motivated by the two fund theorem. So, we started off by looking at a database of some blue chip stock companies and then we look at their moments and we looked at the efficient frontier of those uh, uh, along with the scatter plot of each of the individual assets which constitute that particular uh, database uh, namely there are 30 assets that are there. And then we looked at what is the efficient frontier and we brought about a tangent line uh, to that efficient frontier. Now, once you have done that, once you determine what is the efficient frontier, we brought about into constraints such as uh, the, the constraint, the first constraint that we looked at was trying to figure out the points on the efficient frontier or that portfolio for a specified level of expected return on the part of the investor and this was followed by. Uh, the optimal portfolio on the efficient frontier for a pre-specified tolerance level of risk of the investor. Now, next we looked at uh, the efficient frontiers uh, with the targeted portfolios and we looked at the efficient frontiers by incorporating two constraints namely one which involves the buying and selling or that is the transaction cost and the other was the turnover constraint. Uh, in addition to that we looked at the portfolio optimization and we use the maximization of the sharp ratio as the goal and it turned out that we could visualize that the maximized sharp ratio portfolio is the one which is the point of tangency uh, of the tangent line and the efficient frontier. And then we looked at a couple of interesting applications uh, from the more sophisticated setup of hedge fund management namely the dollar neutral portfolio valuation. Uh, where you actually have that uh, the long and short positions in the portfolio 
are exactly matching each other, so that the net value is 0 and the other setup which is called 130 setup, where uh, 130 percent of the assets are invested in the long position and the 30 percent are invested in the short position or equivalently some 100 plus x percent uh, of the portfolio is in long position and x percent is the short position resulting in a net uh, portfolio position of 100 uh, percent. So, this brings us to the end of this lecture and in the next lecture which will be the concluding lecture of the course, we will talk about a few more examples again making use of the financial toolbox of MATLAB. Thank you.